Good day. My name is Mrs. Pinar. I'm your tutor for numeracy and mathematics one. Year two, semester one. For DJP and DPP. NM21. This is your assignment as well as your exam based presentation for 2020. Your table of contents, meaning what you should know for this course. The development of pre-primary numeracy, the development of the learner's understanding of numbers, their symbols and their values. Also, how to develop learner's ability to identify features of objects and then how to classify them. How to develop the learner's observation of patterns, sequence, also order numbers. How to develop an understanding of spatial awareness, the four basic operations in mathematics, as well as problem solving, measurement of time, length, mass, and capacity, also three and two dimensional shapes, including data analysis, and then the teaching and learning activities and materials for pre-primary numeracy and mathematics. We will start our presentation with activities to understand some mathematical concepts. What are the activities? First of all, we need to understand activities means we should we should, activities means that we should be able to do things. An activity is something that we should do. Let's start with sequencing. When we talk about sequencing, sequencing is simply how we put things in order. So for my child, to be able to understand or to practice sequencing, I can do many activities. One of the activities that I brought along is to play with some counters, colorful counters, or I can even use some bottle caps. Now, to explain sequencing to my child, I can put some Counters in order, three red, two green, one yellow. Again, three red, two green, one yellow. And then I can ask my child, I give him a few counters, and I ask my child to continue with the pattern. How to continue with the sequence? So, so from what I see here, my child should be able to add three red, two green, and one yellow. So this is how I can, uh, some of the activities that I can do with sequencing. Then, how to classify color, shape, and size. Same, I use my counters, or... What I did here is I took a normal egg box and I gave it different colors. Then I collected some bottle caps, normal bottle caps. So I can give my child a few bottle caps and then I can ask my child to put the bottle cap in the correct color of what he has seen. So here, 
I'm teaching my child, my pre-primary and my junior primary child, about colors. So the child is going to look at the color of the bottle cap and see where it fits in the color of the egg, bo egg box that I have colored for him. So some simple activities that I can do in my class and it's available because bottle caps is available. I can even involve my children to bring bottle caps to school, different colors. So this is an activity to classify color. Now when it comes to the classification of shapes, I should have a few different shapes. So here I have different shapes. And I use my different shapes and I ask my child to, doesn't matter about the size of the shape, I ask my child to give me all the same shapes that he sees. So from my different shapes, I would ask my child to take one shape and then you bring all the shapes that have the same shape. So the child will start collecting all the circles from what he see. I'll give him another shape, ask the child to bring all the shapes that he see that looks the same. So this is classification of shapes. So here I have different shapes that the child have classified for me. When I go to size, now I take the shape and I ask the child to give me the, the size. It's, they are all circles. Now which ones do you see have the same size? So the child will collect all the circles that have the same size or all the squares that have the same size. So here, yeah, when I do activities, Everything is practical for my child. I use a lot of practical things. Even these counters, they are also circles. So the child will know that these are small ones, these are medium ones, and these are large shapes of the same shape. So I will also ask my child to order these shapes in different sizes. Bigger little bit smaller and then the smallest shape of the circles. So this is all classification using color, shape and size. And these are activities that can be done in my class. Counting. Exactly the same that we have done using my box, my egg box. So as the child, as the child take all the red counters or all the red bottle caps, the, ca the child should count aloud so that the child knows the number as he counts. So the child will put one, two, three, four, five. So the child should be able to tell you that he has now five counters that is of red color. Um, I can even give my child a number and ask the child to identify the number and give me the same number of counters that he sees. So now the child will identify the number, the, the symbol, which we call the symbol. The child will identify the symbol with the number of items. So now the child will collect and tell me one, two, three, four, five. So now the child puts the symbol with the number of items that he has collected. Sabotizing. What is sabotizing? Sabotizing is simply when the child 
can identify a number without counting, usually small numbers. So in this case, I make use of, I can make use of a dice. I throw the dice, the child sees the numbers and the number and without counting, the child can Im immediately identify that this is number four or these are four dots. I've also made, so we don't have to buy, you can make, I use a box and I put dots on the box and the child can play and the child can say this is one and he can even tell me the color. So this is one and it's of red color. So we can play around two, the child can see two dots, it tells me it's two and he can see the color and I can even ask him to go get an, the symbol of two. So these are things that I can use in my class. So this is sabotaging. Immediately recognizing the number without counting. Thank you. Just so that you take note of this, very important. When we do activities, we use practical activities during our lesson presentation. To develop pre-primary numeracy. First, sequencing, ordering, putting events, ideas or objects in logical order. Like we said earlier, sequencing, putting things in logical order. So, some informal activities to practice sequencing. Picture sequencing. What do we mean by picture sequencing? We can have pictures of, the example that I have there is a picture of how you, if you want to make a sandwich for yourself. So the child is going to make himself a sandwich and using those pictures, the child now put those pictures in a sequence meaning the one that comes first, what he does first, take out the bread, then take out the jam, put the jam on the bread, and then eat the bread. So that is how I can practice sequencing. Photo sequencing, I can ask my child to bring, bring some pictures from home, from when he was a little baby, up to the age the child is now. Even if it's just three or four pictures. So with that pictures, the child put those pictures now in a sequence from when the child was a baby up to where the child, the age of the child is now. That is how I practice sequencing, practical activities. Same with letter and number sequencing. I take the letters of the alphabet, not necessarily how they come one after the other, same with numbering. I, I Maybe I take one and six, and 10 and 20. So now I scramble those numbers and the child is now supposed to put them in a sequence. So the child must know which of those numbers come first or which of those letters of the alphabet comes first for him to be able to continue with the sequence. Sequencing in daily life. Uh, the child can bring pictures or the child can even tell us what he does from when he gets up until he gets to school. Maybe start off with he gets up, he brushes his teeth, he gets into the bath, put on his school uniform or his clothes and then come to school. Whatever he does first, that is just to get their minds to know what is a se what is sequence, things that you do in order. That, was, that is the example that I used, right? Just to stress what we have said, classifying and sorting. So when learners group things together, using color, size, shape, or kind, like we showed earlier, different activities in sorting objects, grouping of blocks, like we did, using color, shape, or size, 
Another way of how we can classify or sort items is using household items. I can have some pictures of fruits and vegetables and the child needs to now put them in, in a table and say this is a fruit and this is a vegetable. Another way how I can do it practical is using pictures to paste in tables using likes or dislikes. So even I can make use of those fruits and vegetables. Many of our learners uh, don't like some vegetables, so many of our children do not like some vegetables. So for me to bring a few pictures of fruit and vegetables to class or even sweets, and then the child needs to put it in a table saying likes and dislikes. This is all classifying. They classify according to shape, size, color, or kind. Same with in the grocery store. The child needs to, to know which ones are meat, which ones are frozen food, which ones are sweet things. So all those practical examples can help a child to understand classifying or sorting. Just a practical example there. Um, on this picture here, we have how the child can use a cut or a, I give the child a worksheet and the child needs to be able to classify. From the first picture, we can see there are some clothing materials and then we have a drum and a boat. So the child should now circle which ones of those ones do not compare with the others. In the next worksheet, they have to now draw a line around the ones that are the same. So we have horses, we have some cats, we have some dogs and some cows. So all they do is they draw a circle around the ones that they feel that are the same. So that is a worksheet for practicing classifying and sorting. Right, when it comes to measurement of length, mass, capacity and time. The process of measuring in preschool phase, this, this process of measuring must be seen as a process of comparing attributes of objects. So they just compare. So here I have three strings of the same size. But what I can do is I use the string, the one I put in its length, the one string I curl up, and the other one I curl up more. So now I want my child to identify which one of these strings are the longest and which one is the shortest. So I use practical examples. So from here, from what my child sees, most of them will, will identify this one as the longest, this one as shorter, and this one as the shortest. All I do then is I straighten them, I straighten my string, and now the child can identify them as the exactly the same size. So this is how my child should see measuring. They compare, even like we did earlier, comparing, com comparing. They compare. So from here, from what I have there, the child is able to compare which one of these shapes is the smallest and which one is the largest. So that is how they should do measuring it in their face. <clears throat> we use non-standard standard measuring units. So we don't use meters, centimeters, kilometers. We just use like longer, shorter, bigger, smaller, 
um, thinner, fatter. Those are the um, you the words that we use when we talk about measuring. And then non-measuring instruments are to be used in this phase. So we do not make use of scales or rulers or measuring jars. We only, only make use of what we have. We can have a glass of water and we can have a, a liter bottle of water. And all we do is we fill up the liter bottle with water and we see how many uh, glasses of water can I fill with my uh, liter bottle of water. These are the non-measuring uh, non instruments that I can use when I do measurement. There, just some examples that you have there. How to teach the concept of length. Learners start by using non-standard objects to measure. They can use, like I told you earlier, we can use make use of the string or we can make use of the feet or the hand. If I have to make use of a string, which one of these sides are the longest? So now my child takes the string, he measures with the string, and he sees this is the side of this square. When he goes to the other square, he can immediately see that the green square is, the side of the green square is longer than the side of the yellow square. So they make use of non-standard objects. Even their feet to measure the length of the classroom. So the child will count how many feet putting his heel to toe. So almost like if this is my, my foot, my heel, this heel to my toe. So this is how the child will measure the length of the classroom. My hand, same, using my hand, and the child can see the difference of the sizes by making use of his hand. Right. How to teach the, the concept of mass. So here, I can take two different uh, objects with different mass. If I have here, yeah, yeah, I have a, I have wool, yeah, I have a glass of water. So all it requires from the child is to pick one up with his left hand and the other one with his right hand. And now the child should be able to compare the weight. So hefting is simply comparing the weight of two objects. How to teach the concept of time? Please, students, remember, at this age, we do not require our learners to be able to tell time from a watch or a clock. All they should know is the long and short periods of time, meaning how long does it take to get from home to school? How long does it stay in school? Which one is longer? Does it take longer to get from home to school? Or the time that it stays at school, is that one longer or is that one shorter? This is how we compare. So we compare two different times. Long and short periods of time. Um, time of the day. Time of the day is not the time on the clock. Time of the day simply is morning for my child it is morning when he comes to school it is afternoon when he goes home and it's evening when he is at home taking a bath going to sleep so those are the times that i instill in my child morning afternoon and evening days of the week in my class as a pre-primary and junior primary teacher i need to have a calendar of days of the week as well as months of the year. So every day as my child enters the class, I should ask them what day it is. And from the calendar, I can even ask one child to go show me 
which day of the week it is or which, what is the date. And what is interesting for our learners when it comes to the calendar, every month I should, on my calendar, just to make it interesting for them, I should have the birth dates of specific learners that, whose birthdays is that month. So when it comes to the 10th of the month, and the child's birthday is on the 20th, the child now pick up that it is still so many days, it's a long time. But the child whose, child whose birthday is the 12th has a shorter period of time to wait for his birthday than the one whose birthday is on the 20th. Here, I make sure that my child understand time, the length of time. Months of the year, also, I should have the month of the year in my class so that they know when, they should know if it's May, they will be on holiday. When June starts, they will come to school again. December, they will have Christmas. Whenever their birth, month of birth is, they will have their birthdays. This is interesting for my learners and this is how I instill the concept of time. So there I have activities to help learners to grasp the concept of time. I create calendars, like I already said. I use timely words every day. Timely words like yesterday it was Monday, today it's Tuesday. Tomorrow it will be Wednesday. So every day I instill this timely, timely words. I can use books about um, time, especially about days of the week. There are many books that I can read to my learners every day about the days of the week. And then very interesting again is making a countdown chain. So by the end of the month, I, may, I can have a countdown, a countdown chain, like the example I have on the picture there. So every day when this, then the, if a day finish, I get rid of one of the links of the chain. So by the end, towards the end of the month, they can see there are only so many days left, fewer days come as the month progress. This is also helping them to understand time. Right. How to develop the learner's understanding of numbers, their symbols, and values. When it comes to counting, we have two different ways of counting. We have rote counting and we have rational counting. What is the difference between rote counting and rational counting? Rote counting is developed first in any child, is where the child just recites the names. Most of our children at this age now knows how to count to 10, even up to 20. But most of them do not have an understanding how many it is. So I can ask my child to count up to 10, but it does not mean that the child knows how many 9 is. So if I ask my child, go get me 9 stones, he might not be able to, but he can know how to count up to 10. That is road counting. It's developed first and it's just simply the reciting of numbers without understanding. Where rational counting is, it's now a higher level of one-to-one -one correspondence. So now my child can take some items and my child knows that is one, two, three, four. So the child should be able to know the number as well as how many. So it's one-to-one -one correspondence. So if he talks about four, you should know these are four objects. All right, we continue. What is the advantage of counting? There are different advantages on national level, local level, and personal level. On national level, the advantage of counting is the completion of census Every year or every five years, the government has to do some census to see how many people we are in a specific country. 
So on national level, the advantage of counting is the completion of census. And why do we need these census? Is to make sure that there are enough services, hospitals, there are enough schools, should be enough clinics, and this is on a national level. That is why counting is important. So on local level, why do we need to be able to count? What is the advantage on a local level? This is done by municipalities, and this is sometimes municipalities need to count how many people they live in a specific town or city, and how many cars or traffic there is, so that they will, should be able to put up some traffic lights, they must build some roads, and those are the reasons why it is important for us to be able to count on local level. Why should I be able to count on my personal level? It is for communication. It means if people ask for where do I stay, I need to be able to tell people my address, my phone number, my age, and it's also solving problems. If I need to go to the shop, I, I need to buy things. I need to be able to know how much I should pay, how much my change should be. So this is why I need to be able to count. So math is everywhere. Math is not just a school subject. Math is a subject every day. I need math every day in my life. My shoe size is math. Just is that an example of how we can teach our learners to count. The number of objects, the child must touch each object so that the child can know uh, that there are five objects and then the symbol. <coughs> How do I need to teach doubling and halving? Here yeah, it is also very important, like I said there, I must use some practical examples. I must use sticks, counters or bottle caps or whatever. So I'm going to use some counters now. So let's start with doubling. And start off with small numbers, maybe just numbers between 1 to 10. So I'm going to start off with 2. I show my child two counters. Then I give my child a few counters and I ask my child to double. What should my child do now? He should know when I double, I should add the same number of counters on the one side than on the other side. So I can even draw a circle and ask the child to add another circle and then put the same number of counters on the one side that is on the other side. Whether it's two on this side or three. So I, this means the child should now be able to count. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So doubling is the same number of counters and it should give me six. So this is how I do it practically. The child should know that doubling simply means what I have on the one side, I should have on the other side. And then the total. Right, what is halving then? Now, like I stated there, halving is we only in the at this stage of our learners, we only use even numbers because our learners do not use fractions as yet. So, I, I'm going to use even numbers. So, in this case, I'm going to use four. 4 is an even number, so I'm going to use 4, and I will ask my child to half. Usually, I can even give some sweets to, to, uh, to one learner and ask him to half, meaning give one to each, as many as you have, you give to your friend. So what the child will now do is, if there's 4, he gives one to that friend. You can also have a circle, two circles. So I have four counters, 
Give one to that friend, give one to that friend. Give another one to that friend, give another one to that friend. So when I have four, I have two on this side and I have two on that side. So halving simply means to give the same number of objects to two different halves. But like I said, we only use our uh, um, even numbers. They are not working with fractions yet. So doubling and halving is simply where I double the same number of items on the one side and on the other side, and halving is where I divide by two. My number of items I divide by two. So important, you should use sticks, counters, bottle caps, whatever you can get hold on, but practical. Right. Learning styles. Our learners learn uh, differently. Some learners learn by seeing, some learners uh, learn by hearing, and some learners learn by touching. Now, here we have the learning style of learners that learn visual, what they see. Visual meaning learning by seeing. Now, how do I identify these learners? These learners will prefer images, meaning they want to see pictures or maps. They use, make use of images more. They want to see. These learners, they can visualize objects. They have a good spatial sense. They love drawing. They are the ones that usually, when they have not a lot to do, they will sit in the class and take a paper and they will love drawing. They usually have a good sense of dressing and color balance. Our auditory learners, how do they learn? They are the ones that learn by hearing. These learners will learn better depending on hearing and speaking. So as a teacher, these learners want to hear more. So they should be able to sit close to the teacher so that they can hear what the teacher needs has to say. So they depend on hearing and speaking. They are also the, the ones that's usually the talkative ones in the class because they want to talk all the time because they want to hear. And a learner should be able to hear to learn effective. The learners, our tactile learners, meaning the learners that learn by touching, are the learners that learn through experience and doing things. They are the learners that wants to work with the clay. They want. They are the world learners that. Uh, they are the learners that wants to touch everything. All these objects that we have done here, they want to touch to feel the shape of the circle, to feel the shape of the square, to feel the shape of the triangle. They want to touch. They don't, they are not, they don't want to hear or see only. They want to touch so that they can learn. They learn through touching. So they get bored easily when we speak. As a teacher, when you just talk, these are the learners that will get bored easily because they like to experience the world and they act out events. So they will, will be the ones that do practical things. They want to be out there doing PE all the time. Those are our learners that learn through touching. All right, what is uh, uh, visual discrimination? Visual discrimination is the ability to see the difference and or similarities between objects around us enabling us to understand and interpret the world around us better. The ability to see the differences and similarities. Meaning, if I have two circles, the learner should be able to see that these two are both round. These are the similarities that they have. They are both round. What is the difference in these two objects? The one is blue and the one is yellow. So visual discrimination simply means to see the differences as well as the similarities between objects. What is the role of visual discrimination? Learners must be able to distinguish 
between different letters in order to read and write words. So why do we do practice visual discrimination? When learners start to read, many of them tend to turn the B and the D and the P, those letters, they, they usually turn those around and then they, it's difficult for them to read. So we do these exercises to help our learners to be able to distinguish similarities as well as differences between objects. So learners must be able to distinguish different number symbols and names. Like the six and the nine. They should be able to... I, I teach them the similarities and differences between objects so that they can be able to distinguish differences between number symbols and names. Numbers like six and nine. How do I identify the learners? What with difficulty in visual discrimination. Those are the learners that may not be able to dress themselves. Sometimes at a, at a certain age, five, six years, these learners should be able to be able to dress themselves. So if my learner or if my child has a difficulty with not be able to dress themselves, I must be alert that they, this child might have a difficulty with visual discrimination. There are all also the ones that is not able to distinguish similarities and differences in formation of letters. Again, making use of B and D, they cannot distinguish between B and D. Then I know or should be alert that this child might have difficulty with visual discrimination. Then, they are also the ones that cannot distinguish between the size of letters or objects. So if the objects are of different size, then usually they will not be able to say that this one is bigger than this one. Then I should be alert of this child might have a problem with visual discrimination. What is form const uh, constancy? Form constancy is the ability that allows you to understand that a shape or object stays the same even if you view, view it from different directions, environments or with different size. Activities to help learners develop form constancy. So form constancy, the child must be able to see what is outside what he has learned. Uh, for instance, this is a circle. So if he goes outside, if he goes home, should be able to know that the, the plate that he eats in is also a circle, although it isn't in class. So how do I uh, help this child with this form constancy? I cut out shapes and group them so that the learner can arrange them from a big to small, these shapes that we have done earlier. We ask learners to point out objects in the class that looks like a certain shape. So if I have a square, I can ask the child to find another square, maybe the window or whatever squares there are in the, his desk, whatever he has there in front of him. And I can make use of worksheets. There's a worksheet, so the uh, child needs to simply find the one that is the same direction and the same shape as the one that is on the one side. What is ordinal numbers and cardinal numbers? Ordinal numbers is the ones that tell us position. He came first, uh, when they had athletics, he came first, that one came second, that one came third, ordinal numbers. And cardinal numbers is the numbers that we count, one, two, three, four, five. So don't confuse, ordinal, position, First, second, third, cardinal, one, two, three, four, five. What is spatial awareness? Spatial awareness is the ability to understand and interact with the environment around you. You should be able to understand and interact with the envir environment around you. Characteristics of learners with poor spatial awareness, learners that are not aware of the environment, they are usually clumsy, they bump into anything, 
uh, in the into the desk, into the chairs in the classroom. So they are usually clumsy. They are unable to tell left from right. They have difficulty doing physical activities, playing games outside. They have problems copying patterns and shapes, and problems interpreting instructions. If you tell the learner, go fetch some water, go to the door, go find what the child has problems. So that then you should immediately be aware that this child has a problem with spatial awareness. How to extend or expand the learner's vocabulary of spatial concepts? We play games. The games that we can play is I spy with my little eye. So you as a teacher will describe something maybe on your, on your table, um, a circle, so you'll say it's round, it's yellow. It's, so all those games, that is games that we can play. Or Simon says go behind the door, go under the table giving oral directions, place toys in position, ask a child to take the teddy bear and go put it on top of this table. All these activities is how we can learn or try and understand or make our learners aware of spatial concepts. There we have another few that you can read through for yourselves. Reading and writing of numbers in words and in numerals. The numbers are the numerals and then the words. So you should be able, also be able to write and read numbers. Data handling. When it comes to data handling, um, yeah, we need to know a few things. When it comes to data handling, all we need to know is on the graph. Um, we should be aware of words like the difference. If we ask for the difference in something, then we should know we should subtract. What will I have there? Those cupcakes there, Monday and Wednesday. What is the difference? So now I look at my key. I see Monday, I have one, two, three, four, five cupcakes, and each cupcake represents six cupcakes. So on Monday, there are 30 cupcakes that were sold. On Wednesday, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 4 times 6 gives me 24. So if I ask for the difference, meaning 30 minus 24, which will give me 6. Difference. When I ask for the total, when we ask for the total of something, we add up everything together. When we ask for the average, I add up everything and then I divide it by the number of items. So if I ask for the average number of cupcakes, I will add up all those cupcakes and divide it by the seven days. I should be aware of some of the words when it comes to data handling. 2D shapes, I just need to know their properties. If it's a triangle, it has three sides. If it's a square, it has four sides. The difference between the square and the rhombus, I should also be able to know. Both of them have four equal sides. The square only has uh, angles of 90 degrees, where the rhombus do not have angles of 90 degrees. So I should know the properties of my 2D shapes as well as the properties of my 3D shapes. When it comes to Bloom's taxonomy, Verbs meaning doing words. So Bloom's taxonomy shows me that the level of wording that I use when I assess something. There I have a few examples. The basic knowledge is just to be defined or describe or explain. Higher level is apply. Now the child should apply or the child should demonstrate or the child should solve a problem. And a very high level is the child should now evaluate or discuss or find a fact or a source. That is Bloom's taxonomy. Activities to help the child develop hand-eye coordination. Coloring. We can find coloring books everywhere. Traced on dotted lines. I give the child a, a scissor to cut out pictures that helps with 
hand-eye coordination. The child needs to catch a ball, kick a ball, very good with head and eye coordination, skipping with a rope, working with clay, stringing beads, small beads, bigger beads, that all help with hand-eye coordination. Right, finally, examples of calculating time. Right, just what we have here is we have 4 hours, 25 minutes, plus 1 hour, 55 minutes. To solve this problem, all I need to do first is I first add my hours. And then I add my minutes. Four hours plus one hour gives me five hours. Plus 25 minutes plus 55 minutes gives me 80 hours. Ah, sorry, 80 minutes. What do I see? 80 minutes is more than an hour. One hour equals 60 minutes. So I subtract my 60 minutes from my 80 minutes gives me 80 Ah, 20 minutes left. What happens to the 60 minutes? The 60 minutes becomes one more hour. So now I have 6 hours, 20 minutes. I can do the same when it comes to day, uh, the subtraction of 5 days, 10 hours, minus 3 days, 20 hours. I do it separately. I first do my days separate from my hours. And remember... Let me quickly do that for you. 5 days, 10 hours, minus 3 days, 20 hours, will give me, 5 minus 3 gives me 2 days. What happens in the case of 10 hours, minus 20 hours? I go borrow another day from my 2 days, so I have 1 day left. One day equals 24 hours, so now I will have 34 hours minus 20 hours. That will give me one day, 14 hours. Thank you. And this is the end, and good luck. Thank you.